Hello everybody, how are you doing today? This topic brings us to the end of um, our introduction to the history of economic thoughts as a course and I hope you've been enjoying your, your, your time so far and you've learned 18 or 2 and you've probably developed a big note all right, from what you've been doing so far and I also hope that you've been learning that what you've been learning have been relevant you know to your understanding of the history of economic thoughts now let's dive straight into it so neoclassical economics so we have Karl Menger, William Stanley Jevons, Leon Warras, Alfred Marshall and Francis Edwards now if you've ever, if you've done Edwards books in public finance or under utility and okay this was the guy that introduced it Francis Edwards then um, we also have these other people you have probably heard about Alfred Marshall I'm not sure if you've probably heard about Menger, Jevons Except maybe international economics are about and then in wars. So yeah, that's me by the find it boy. <laughs> okay. So our lesson outcomes for today we'll be looking at um five uh, contributors to this school of thoughts, Kamenga. Um okay, there was meant to be a comma there, William Stanley Jevons, the Waras, and on and on. Then we look at the assumptions of New Pascal economics, so, uh, which is um I shorten it as an NCE. So by the time we are talking about it again, you will likely just see NCE. Then we'll talk about the principles of you know, Pascal economics, the criticisms, and then an, uh, an assignment. All right. Now these are the founders, their images, as you know, I've been doing throughout the course. I just let you see. I just let you see the images of you know, the people that um, contributed to the whatever school of uh, thoughts that we are looking at. So look at Kamenga there, that's Jevons, Poirot, Marshall, and Francis Edwards. All right. Okay, um, Karl Menger, he lived between 1840 and 1921. So, Menger contributed to the development of the theories of marginalism, all right, and uh, marginal utility, which rejected cost of production theory of value. That is, uh, this could have taught us, you know, the, 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 I think, the, or one of the major, one of the most significant things that this school of thought did was to, you know, explain what determines the value of a commodity. And then this uh, school of thought was able to successfully, you know, put that debate, you know, you know, down forever, right? So, you know, other schools of thought have been talking about the liberty of value, with this one and that in different forms. But then this school of thought finally put the argument to bed, and you know, made us realize that, you know, it is not the cost of production that should be looked at when you are trying to determine the value and the prices that you, know, you should tag a commodity. So it is supposed to be the satisfaction, you know, the utility, you know, that people derive from that commodity. And of course, you see, uh, before this moment, you must have been doing utility a lot. All right, from your high school up to university level, and this one and that. All right. So you, you realize that, and even you, when you want to buy something, you what you probably consider, what you are likely going to consider, is the satisfaction that you are going to derive from that commodity. You imagine that satisfaction, and then that determines the value you place on the commodity. So if the, if the commodity does not yield that much satisfaction, of course, you do you value less, you know, and so on and so forth. Like it was this that brought up you know, that aspect of economics, okay, that says you look at the marginal utility of things, and that determines you know what people value the products for and what they are willing you know, to pay for it. So it's not just you don't just look at cost of production and whatever, and it's attendant in your problems. All right, so Carpenter was one of the people that was you know significant in the introduction of marginalism, you know, the concept of marginal utility, you know, and so on, you know, into the into um, mainstream economics that today that is what is being studied and that is what is generally accepted, you know, as what determines value to a very large extent. Okay. Um okay, uh, let me just proceed. Um okay, let me read it again. Menga contributed to the development of the theories of marginalism and marginal utility. Which rejected cost of production theory of value, such as developed by the classical economists, you know, E.G. Adam Smith and David Ricardo, and you know, Karl Marx, you know, and other people before you know, this particular school of thought. As a departure from such, he would go on to call his resultant perspective the subjective theory of value. All right, we are going to go into this because this is like the main thing, you know, that this class is about, and that this, you know, neoclassical economics is also a part. Now, when you hear neoclassical, it's an improvement on classical economics. Okay, neoclassical. So if you have new Keynesian to new whatever, so it's just telling that okay, there was a Keynesian school of thought.
thoughts and then this is an improvement on what Kenisha Scrapple was talking about. So that's what you know, it's, it's, it's all about. So it looks at some of the things that um, the Casca Scrapple Economics said and then improves upon some of its weaknesses. And that brings us to new classical economics. Now we have William Stanley Gibbons, who lived between that period. He was an English economist and logician who wrote a book titled A General Mathematical Theory of Political Economy, you know, as the start of the mathematical methods in economics. So some of you that don't like mathematics in economics, I think you, you are already beginning to know the people to nail and the people to crucify. Alright, so this this school of thought in general introduced a lot of mathematics into economics and then it's it's went on from there and by the time you're studying economics today especially microeconomics you'll be dealing with a lot of equations and then the equations might be more than the concept that you're trying to learn right than the economics concept that you're trying to learn all right so these are the guys that brought this is one of the guys you know that brought mathematics you know the, the mathematical paradigm into economics now in so doing it it's expanded upon the final marginal utility theory of value be building uh it's expanding upon the final marginal utility, marginal utility theory of value, building upon the works of Carmenga and Linguaras on the subject. Jivon's contribution has led to the ushering of a new paradigm in economics that is in the form of mathematics. So Linguaras, he was a French mathematical economist. He formulated the marginal utility theory of value uh, independently of William Stanley Jivons and Carmenga. So it's more or less like uh, Carmenga was working on the theory and Linguaras in another place. Was also working on theory, so you know, by the time these guys then put forth their contributions, it's it was telling like wow, like did you guys sit down together to come up with this thing? All right, and pioneered the development of general equilibrium theory. Of course, you would also in the mathematical economics, you would uh, be talking about general equilibrium and you know, so you're all those in the equilibrium, whatever. Um, I think, I think examples. Uh, your different equations, differential equations, all of those things. All right, he contributed immensely to the mathematization of economics to the concept of general equilibrium. So, second person to nail. Now, Alfred Marshall, he was an English economist and was one of the most influential economists of his time. His book, Principles of Economics, was the dominant economic textbook in England for many years. So, it looks as if our issue of economic thought is significantly centered around Britain and England. Well, well, well it is what it is. So it brought the ideas of supply and demand, marginal utility, and cost of production into a coherent whole. He is known as one of the founders of neoclassical economics. Marshall took economics to a more mathematically rigorous level. Okay, interesting. But did not desire to make mathematics of a shadow economics by making economics uninterpretable to the layman. So in his books, in his publications, then, so uh, Alfred Marshall was in the of mathematics, but then. He used to leave mathematics as a footnote in his publication. So, was he going to talk about you know, the economics of things, the economics of the mathematics, okay, so that this, his publications will be readable by even the layman and it's going to make sense to them? But then he left mathematical, the mathematical aspect in the footnote, so for those who are interested in it and for those who can understand it. So, we also have Francis Edwards, okay, he was an Anglo Irish philosopher and political economist who made significant contributions to the method of statistics during the 80, 80s. Okay, then uh, from statistics, uh, something probably comes to mind, um, econometrics. All right, so, you know, econometrics as a, a, is the combination of statistical tools, is the application of statistical tools to economic theory. All right, and then to test, you know, if this economic theory is sound with the aid of data, interview, analyze data, the data analysis, and all of those things. So now, we also seen uh, one of the people that introduced all of these things into mathematical, into uh, economics as a field of study. All right, so Edwards was a highly influential figure in the development of mathematical economics. He was the first to apply certain formal mathematical techniques to individual decision making in economics. He developed, he also developed the utility theory, let's put it that way. Introducing the indifference curve and the famous Edwards box, all right, which is now familiar to the graduate students of microeconomics. So I think that's that about the introduction of these guys. And then, in summary, you kind of seen some of the things or just some of the significant things that he contributed to the field of economics. You know, putting them together under new classical economics. All right. So what does new classical economics now like? What does it stand for? So NCE is a 20th century economic school of thought that expanded upon classical economics. Now, I've already mentioned that. So when you say new, like an improvement upon, all right, so it's starting from classical economics. So some of the things that classical economics holds true 
Now this school of thought was also going to, you know, hold it true, you know, and then it's improved on the weaknesses of um, classical economics. Okay, so let's go again. You know, classical economics is a 20th century economic school of thought that expanded upon classical economics and the concept of utility maximization and marginalism. So marginalism is the insight that people make economic decisions over specific units and increments of units rather than making categorical all or nothing decisions. Now, from your first principle of economics, you would have learned that people, um, um, rational people think at the margin. So, like this was the school that brought about all of those things. Now, okay, when people want to you know, uh, carry out a specific activity, they look at the marginal cost of the activity and then the marginal benefits and then they weigh. All right, you weigh the two. So, which is more? If the marginal benefit is you know, at least equal to the marginal cost of you know that decision, then you carry it out. Okay. Uh, and you know, vice versa. So the same thing goes for every economic agent, be it household, be it the firms, be it the government, be it the foreign sector, all right, be it the, the central bank, you know, or the Federal Reserve Bank of your country. So everybody, when you're trying to carry out um, something, it's not as if you're looking at, you're trying to make a, a all or nothing decision, or maybe you're trying to look at, uh, you know, some of the total of your decision in the past or whatever. So even as a business person, you look at this thing that I want to do, is it does it cost me more okay like in terms of additional cost or does it uh, benefit me more in terms of additional benefit and then i put it two together and then wait all right so this school of thought was what brought about the marginal revolution okay or is it is it marginalist revolution now marginal revolution okay you know it's just talking about the embryo of marginal concepts okay marginal utility marginal product of labor marginal profit marginal this marginal that so like it was, it was it was it was a school of thought but it was a revolution of marginals revolution of marginals all right so you know that i think that sets us that so nc is a broad approach that attempts to explain the production pricing okay that is trying to tell you what it means value and what it means how you should price a product it, the price that you should put on it and it determines the consumption of goods and services all right marginal utility and all of that and then income distribution through supply and demand so in the early 20th century, imperfect competition models were introduced into NC, such as indifferent curves, marginal revenue curves. Of course, my, um, okay, we don't have the utility curves, just okay, we do, right? Yeah, we do. In yeah, that curve that continuous, they are continuously slopes downward, right? As a consumer consumes more units of the commodity, right? So you have all of that too. Okay, marginal plus curve, etc. Now the new tools were instrumental in improving the sophistication of economics and mathematical approach. All right, so we already mentioned it. A lot of mathematics came into this thing because they were the attempt was to make economics a science. All right, and then if you're asked today, uh, what wow, is economics a science? Of course, okay, it is a science not because of the subject of study, but because of its method of study, its approach of study. So economics uses applies okay, applies this scientific method, you know, carrying out observation and. Um, uh, make it, uh, um, you have observation, you have um, hypothesis, possible explanation to what you've observed, and you begin to make, I think, is it observation, inquiry, okay, okay, observation, inquiry, hypothesis, you gather data, analyze data, you know, interpret your results from the theory, or try a conclusion, a lot of those things, right? So, they were trying to make um, um, economics to, to, uh, to, uh, to look like a science, okay, or to be a science. And that was what called for all of this mathematics, you know, and all of that. So assumptions of the NC, people are rationally making choices, which is the same thing as the assumption under classical economics. And individuals want to maximize utility and, and firms want to maximize profit. So everybody wants to maximize whatever decision that they're making. Okay. Or everyone wants to maximize resources in one way or the other. And people act independently on perfect food and relevant information. This is also stemming from you know classical economics and other assumptions of classical economics that um you can you know think of. All right, so the principles. So I'm gonna dwell a lot on subjective theory of value because this is significant. This is significant in the issue of economic thought. This is significant. So, like, we'll be going one after the other to explain what it means, okay, and so on and so forth. This is one of the most resounding contribution of this school of thought to the study of economics. It puts the debate on what determines the value of product to bed outstandingly. Now, the theory was able to reveal the inadequacies of the, the inadequacies of the different shades of the labor theory of value, you know, because the way the physical theory of value. The way, um, what do you call it? 
um, the classical school, the, um, the Karl Marx, the Martian school, you know, they had different shades, so they were improving upon it a little bit. But then, this selective theory of value just like just I kind of threw it off the window, threw the theory of value off the window, like totally. So according to this theory, the value of any good is not just determined by the value of the inherent components of labor involved in its production. Okay, so that is, it's just telling you that the value of a commodity is not about its cost of production. You can spend a lot of money producing something that people don't value at the end of the day, and it's not going to command a good price in the market. All right, but instead, it is also determined by the consumers of the product, and that value perceived across buyers of the product is subjective. So that is what brings about the subjective theory of value. Okay, because it looks at individuals. They may value a thing. All right, they may value a laptop. Or a particular brand of laptop is likely going to be different from your value of, of that particular laptop or, or, or the value that it is on the particular laptop. So, like, it's not really about cost of production, it's about people. And then it's it's based on preference, it's, it's based on how important the product is to individuals and so on and so forth. Like, value is subjective, right? Value is more of, from the consumer side. And then it's subjective. Like, what are you guys talking about? What does liberty value mean? Some might value the products more or less, I'm still reading, than others, which I've explained. In addition, people's decision making about consumption depends on the evolution of utility and that marginal utility diminishes with successive consumption of a commodity. Okay, so this is another way of saying what we've said already. Alright, so if I want to consume something, I'm looking at my satisfaction. Okay, how is this thing going to benefit me? What is it going to add to my life? It's not adding a lot of things to my life. And it always come at a high price. Um, the value I place on this is, is going to be little. All right. So if it's not value, add, add, it's not there's no value addition to this. So why should I buy it? And what do I need it for? Okay. Yes, with a decline in marginal utility, the value of individual place on the commodity rises. So this is just talking about the diminishing, the law of diminishing marginal utility, which you must have been learning a lot before this particular period. Now the subjective theory of value espouses the role of demand. And not just supply the process of price determination. Now, the theory also helps to explain the reason for the increase in the value of the commodity. After its creation, that is, after I've created something, what could probably make people value it more? Okay, like people just have to like value it more. The commodity has been there for a while, and people have been saying it, but then something just happens and they just begin to value it more. It doesn't mean that the producer has incurred more cost of production or whatever. Okay, so the theory also explains helps to explain the reason for the increase in the value of the commodity after its creation in that the good might be perceived as being of greater importance or more desirable with time as a result of age okay individuals age okay you, there are things you didn't value when you were you know that thing that we don't value you know um, um, um that we didn't value when we were, ki when we were kids but now you, you begin to value them right and there are things that you also need to value as your old age all right and you are not they don't really place a lot of value on them now. Now you have changes in personal affinity that have caused drastic significance of that product. Maybe you move from uh, 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 from a culture where something a product wasn't that valued, and then you are now taking up another culture where something is you know valuable, and then you begin to perceive you know that commodity in a better light, and they begin to value more. Carl Menga also stated that the value of a good might be perceived higher than its real value due to uncertainty. Which does create a disparity between the goods actual value and its perceived you know, value. So when you don't you know, when you're starting about something, you might you might wrongfully estimate the value of that thing. You might wrongfully think something is more you know, there are times when you buy something and then you know, um I think when people say uh, the difference between what I ordered and what I got. So the way the, the way the whole thing is, okay, you're like, Oh, this is an incredible product. And then by the time you get it, you're like, Oh wow, what's this this it's crap, right? It's just crap. All right, the modern version of the theory has also explained why the value of a non essential good like gold and diamonds can be higher than essential commodities and why relatively expensive, expensive goods can have low production cost. Okay, so, like, you know, we, you know we're talking about the um, gold, um, the diamond gold paradox that uh, why is that diamond commands higher value and then. You know, gold comma um, water comma no value, and then there are also some products that, um, by the time really understand how much it costs for this to produce them, it's kind of small. Okay, the marginal cost of production of such commodities is kind of small, but then you have people placing a very high premium 
on that value. Okay, because you know when you look at the labor theory of value, you know it's essentially saying that if a lot of labor hours goes into the production of the commodities, then the, the, the commodities should command a lot of value, right? And vice versa. But then this subjective theory of value is saying that there are times that some products, you know, their cost of production is small, but then they sell for a very high price. Not that their cost of production is that small, okay? But then relatively, you know, compared to the amount that it is selling for, right? Because people just happen to value the product a lot, you know, and then what does labor theory of does the labor theory of value have an answer to that? And then there are also some commodities that their cost of production happens to be very high, right? But then the value that people place on it is more or less a little, or then or um just kind of almost equal to the price tag of the product. Okay, so like what then explains why a product that doesn't have you know that that is kind of as a low production cost, kind of have a low production cost or as a low production cost is now. You know, like think about these things. You know, like why, 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 why? When you, when you look at online materials, for example, that are easy to duplicate, somebody buys the material and then maybe a book or something, and then you have a lot of dollars. And then what is the marginal cost of producing an additional copy of the book to an additional buyer? All right, the marginal cost is kind of you know lead to you know it's an online product, right? So. Once it is there, like people can get several copies. You know, it's not as if it is a limited kind of. It's not as if you have it on the shelf that people can, you know, take it over and then publisher has to like begin to like put money into publishing. Now, like this book, you've already created the same as movies. Okay, you've already created these things and then they are online. Okay, but well, and I'm still talking about books, right? They are online, so one person in the country gets it the book for like fifty dollars, another person in another country gets the book like fifty dollars again. So like, what's the marginal cost of producing an additional copy? For the other citizen or for the other person in another, you know, the state, in another country. But then people may have talked about that book a lot. They like this book is great. Maybe Atomic Habit. Maybe um um Things Fall Apart by Chino Achebe. Okay, maybe you know different kind of books like that. And then you're like, I must read this book too. I want to get this book. And then you go on to spend a lot of your last to get the book. So what an explain that imagine that of culture is close to zero, right? But then. There's a lot of value in it. You understand? So, like, what can you say about that? Okay. Now, um, this modern version was independently and nearly simultaneously propounded by Javon, Boras, and Menga. The theory explains that it's more of consumer subjective value. Once people place a high value on a product or a high premium on a product, the product, the production cost doesn't really matter. Okay. The product will come at a high price. Also, in resolving the water diamond paradox, the theory explains that diamond commands more price than water. Because people place far more value on diamond than water as a result of the scarcity of diamond compared to water. Okay, it's not really labor hours, whatever. People just place a premium on this thing, you know, because it's, it's scarce, right? You don't really get to see it right around than the water that you have everywhere, you know. So people place a premium on it. You know, like, these are the issues, right? These are the issues, and I hope you've understood that aspect. Now, the theory also explains that trade takes place between two parties because either party places a lower value on what is given up during the transaction compared to what is to be gained from the transaction. So, um, if the two of us are trading, you know, because um, this cost is to be you know, sold to non MOG uh, school of economics students, and then for those who are MOG school of economics students, like you've already paid for it. Right, so like you look at it, for me to sell to you, the price, the, the money that I'm going to be getting from you has to be kind of, you know, um, higher than what, um, what I'm trying to sell this product for, okay, or what I, I or how do I even put it now, um, what I'm giving up, right, has to be lower than what I'm going to get from you. Same thing goes for you, right, so the amount, for you it is money, the amount of money that you're paying, okay, for you to attend this class, for you to be a beneficiary of this class is, you know, small compared to the, the value that you uh, you've estimated they are going to get from you know, attending the class. Right? So, like that's what goes for everybody. So, once that is in place, trade is going to happen. But once that is not in place, trade trade will not happen. Right? So, it's it's all subject. All of us are just like that. And then we assume the rational. Like one of the assumptions, like and rationality, means that you are always comparing the marginal benefits and the marginal um, cost of an activity before going into it. Okay, and then. When the marginal benefit is more, you go into it. When the marginal benefit is less, you back off. Now, free markets. Okay, 
Now, NC advocated for free market. You know, free market also stands for um, 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 the stand of Kafka economics or classical economic school of thought. So we shouldn't spend too much time on this. NC advocated for free market, and that market equilibrium is the key to an efficient resource allocation and should be one of the primary economic priorities of a given country. So we're talking about where demand and supply meets, allow the, uh, allow the market forces to work. They will always allocate resources efficiently. They will always get to that efficient point where demand equals supply. And I think I've explained this in previous classes, like there's no need to like um, overflow this again. So the free market is competitive and the more the number of buyers and sellers that engage in a voluntary exchange, the more efficient resource allocation will be. Because producers will not produce what significant number of people do not profitable, profitably value. So when I say profitably value, it's not enough for people to value it, but they, and they also pay for it. And then the amount of money that they are willing to pay for it, does it, um, does it leave you with a considerable um, amount of profit? So that's what I mean by profitably value, right? So, um, what I say again, the free market is competitive and the more the number of buyers and sellers that engage in the product exchange, the more efficient resource allocation will be. Because producers will not produce what same kind number of people do not profitably value if they want to make profit and remain in business. The how much buyers value a product reflect in the kind of technology employed in the production of the product as producers strive to maximize profit. So if people don't really place a high value on the product, then why should I go and waste money on a very expensive technology? You know, when the product would eventually sell for something that would not make me uh, it uh, would not give me room to cover my cost of production. Okay, and then, um, well, in another another uh, perspective, could also be that um, when the value, when the price that people would need to pay the product is kind of small, that, that makes you kind of try to invest in the technology that would ensure that your cost of production is minimized, so that you still get you know um, profits from every product that you sell. Okay, or from the products that you sell in general. All right, how much buyers value products reflect in the kind of technology and in the production of the product as producers, whatever. Now, furthermore, furthermore, in a free market economy, goods and services are produced based on the purchasing power of a significant number of buyers, which in turn depends on their you know, level of income. So this is the kind of trying to throw more light on what I call profitably value. Okay, it produces something that a significant number of people like. You are looking at the market demand for your product. You are looking at your customers. Okay, so whatever it is that you are producing, okay, uh, should, uh, should be based or is in the free market economy is based on you know uh, the affordability, okay, of people as well, the value that they place on it as well as the affordability of the product. All right. So and you know affordability is also going to stand from their income level because if you produce something that people cannot afford, even though the value, right, people may value something that I like, may be very good, for example, like you know, um, uh, Citroen vehicles and whatever. People may value this as highly, but they may not be able to pay for it. Okay, so you must ensure that the free market economy ensures that, you know, products that are produced are things that are valued by the people and then things that people can buy. Okay, they might command very high prices, but then your market demand, your, your market must be that okay, people can afford to pay those high prices. Okay, so there's no point you know, having a lot of airports and whatever that engages in international travel in a very poor village. If people might value traveling out, but then do they have the money to do so? All right, so criticism, so we're almost done. Um, number one, um, unrealistic assumptions. People neither have perfect information nor are often rational. There are times when people make emotional decisions, all right, especially the women, okay? I know some of you will be watching this video, right? Okay. So there are times that you just make some emotional decisions and it's not rational when you just do it. Okay. Now um, number two, over dependence on the mathematical approach. Classical economics approach was more of empirical, that is the classical economics, especially um, if you look if you remember um, the uh, physiocrat, the table economic A, okay, it was more of empirical, the kind of data and trying to formulate a theory out of it. But here a lot of mathematics. What, what is in difference curve? Like, who draws an indifference curve in this life? If you want to get something, who draws an indifference curve? How do you measure your marginal utility, for example? Okay, I can't see the marginal utility that I'm deriving from the consumption of this video right here is 20. What determines 20? <laughs> do you understand? So, just like that. 
So the classical economics are is more of empirical and historical, but NC has been precise in content theoretical models, so mathematical that so mathematical, but couldn't explain the actual economy. Okay, a lot of mathematics, mathematical jargon, solve equations, equations 20, 21, 25, whatever, and then okay, so what I'm trying to do here, guys. I don't get what I'm trying to do. Alright, so I think you must have been coming across this like that in your microeconomics classes, and then you're like lecturer, like please. What is the summary of it all? <laughs> Alright, so there is so much emphasis on profit, okay? Um, the profit, the pursuit of profit at all costs may lead to inequality. Uh, worker exploitation, environment, and administration should be difficult, you know, stemming from capitalism because free market economy is essentially capitalism. So when we say allow the free market to work, we are saying allow the economy to be capitalist. Okay, there are growth without development. Higher GDP from efficient technology does not always equal higher living standards, especially when workers are badly paid and kept in hard work, you know, and environment. All right, so it was, um, it was a uh, Friedrich, uh, uh, Friedrich um, Engels from the previous class. I was talking about the working conditions in England, how women were subjected to, you know, torture, women and children, you know, how people were subjected to terrible work environments, you know, people were dying. Okay, you know, women at some point, the kind of work they were doing could not allow them to have babies you know, anymore, you know, during the school. So, like, capitalism left its own campuses. I'm still saying that it can be very immoral. Immoral, like, it doesn't really care about morality, it's only about the profit, okay? And then, that's that's it. All right. Um, uh, next, we have your assignment. This cause three strengths and weaknesses of NCE, right? And then number two, discuss the disagreement of the classical school of thought uh, from the or and the uh, from the classical school of thought. They agreed on some things, and then they disagreed on a couple of things. So discuss those disagreements okay, because it's, it's those disagreements that makes what we call the you know, classical school. Uh, um, Neoclassical economics kind of thoughts, right? So let's drop note on two other contributions of the major proponents of the neoclassical economics of neoclassical economics to the study of economics. All right. So the guys that we saw, you know, and then um, you know, we literally spoke about subjective theory of value, and then we spoke about free market. Okay. So there were other things that they contributed, which didn't, did not necessarily enter into neoclassical uh, economics, you know, as an umbrella. But then those discussions found their way elsewhere so like look for two of them and then write short notes you know on them so that means you'll be coming up with 10 um um, um 10 items right so that's it that's it so with this we've been able to successfully come to the end of um, history of economics okay and i call it introduction because there is also a second part of it which i don't know when i'm going to start it yet but then i hope you enjoyed the course i hope you found it lucky so whatever uh, if you have comments for us things you think we should improve upon Okay, leave them in the comment section. We are going to follow up. Uh, thank you so much for being with us up to this uh, period. I appreciate it and see you when I see you. Thank you.